Hello everyone and welcome to the third Ungleich Tech Talk. Today's topic is NUT64 and it's supposed to be a gentle introduction, a bit about stateful and stateless NUT64. The motivation for this talk is after my last talk about how to use NUT64, I got a lot of questions regarding, well, how does it actually work in the background, these NUT64? Last time we used it uh, within VWIP, but uh, yeah, a lot of people were asking like, what is this magic? How is this actually working in the background? And today I want to lift uh, this magic a little bit. So generally speaking, um, NUT64 is one technology. There are other technologies to convert IPv6 to IPv4. And obviously you can also convert IPv4 to IPv6. Generally speaking, you will actually do it both ways anyway. So let's say you are in an IPv6 only network and you want to reach the IPv4 internet, then you will translate from IPv6 to IPv4 in one way, but you will translate from IPv4 to IPv6 on the way back. So in many cases, what you actually do is um, you think about it like translating from v6 to v4 or from v4 to v6 because this is your primary use case. In reality, your translator, your NUT64 translator, will always do translations in both directions because otherwise the packet wouldn't come back and it wouldn't be very helpful. So generally speaking, uh, NUT64 is made so that you can access the other protocol, so IPv4 hosts can access IPv6 hosts, and IPv6 hosts can I access IPv4 hosts. How it works in general is actually quite easy when you look at it like really from top down. So basically, when you have an IPv6 packet, um, NUT64 will remove the IPv6 header and replace it with an IPv4 header. The header are somewhat similar and a lot of flags are actually overlapping but obviously the source and destination address which in IPv6 case is 128 bit and in the IPv4 case is only 32 bit they need to be replaced with something sensible and this, this is usually a parameter that you give to your translator and because you change the header and also the source and destination address in there the checksums in TCP UDP are incorrect afterwards because they actually use information from the IP header. So a NUT64 translator first modifies those headers and then later has to adjust checksums uh, in TCP and UDP. That's the general way how a NUT64 translator works. So it's actually not so hard to write one yourself. I've done it myself for my master thesis, so um, I've seen it in detail. Obviously, you need to have a lot of corner cases that you need to have a look at, but generally speaking, it's all you do. You remove one header, you add a new header, and you add the correct source and destination addresses, and you correct the checksums, plus minus. When you look at it in terms of um, operations, there's a big asymmetry in NUT64, and that is when you come from an IPv6 only network, it is very easy to address the whole IPv4 internet. So here on the left side, we have a typical slash 64 IPv6 network. Then here I use the well-known uh, NUT64 prefix, but this can also be a prefix from your own network. And this is a slash 96. Sl a slash 96 is a 32 bit in the IPv6 world, which is equivalent to the whole IPv4 address space. Now, this is something, and I will repeat this here because it's very important. These 32 bits in the IPv6 space are a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. So you always have space for cutting off the uh, 32 bit anywhere. And if you don't, you can use the well-known prefix here. It's also a bit of a matter of taste, uh, which one you use. The point is the whole IPv4 internet is just a tiny, tiny sub network of any regular IPv6 uh, network. So in theory, every IPv6 LAN 
every IPv6 networks that you ha have could have a tiny bit cut out and say like, mm, this range is actually the IPv4 internet, the whole worldwide IPv4 internet. I can map in a tiny bit of my LAN here. When it comes to the other way around, when I'm in an IPv4 only network and I want to access the whole IPv6 internet, well, I can't per se. Because from the IPv4 world, I, had, I don't have any possibility to map the whole IPv6 internet, which is 128 bit, to every IPv4 address. I mean, this is obviously the reason why IPv6 was invented, is because we wanted to have more addresses, we wanted to have a bigger address space. But it causes this problem or this asymmetry because when you come from an IPv4 only network and you want to access the IPv6 internet, you can't address every IPv6 address. So you, you need to make compromises when you go this direction. In general, we can, uh, we can differentiate two different modes in a NAT64. One of them being stateless NAT64 or SIIT which is usually used for one-to-one -one mappings. So you map one IPv6 address to one IPv4 address, or a range of IPv6 addresses to a range of IPv4 addresses. This is called stateless NAT64. Then on the other hand, we have stateful NAT64, which is used for one-to-n mappings. And this is very much the same or very similar to how you think about NAT in general. So when you're at home and you have your home router, you get one public IPv4 address, it might be static, might be dynamic, doesn't really matter. And you have a lot of other devices in your network which don't have a public IPv4 address, which is also one of the good reasons to invent IPv6. But anyway, point being, there's a one-to-end mapping. You have one IP address that maps to a lot of different other IP addresses. And this actually needs state. And in general, like when you do networking, um, you always prefer to have something stateless because when you have something stateless, then you can, for instance, have multiple routers which do exactly the same. And if one router dies, the other one can take over instantly without even any kind of failover method because you have the state. You can also do state synchronization, but then you can think of like, well, what if you have a split brain and then you need to think about, okay, and you need to have an arbiter. It, gets, it can get really complicated if you have state in your network. And generally speaking, in, I, in the IPv6 world, um, a lot of things get easier because you don't have state. One of them being that uh, IPv6 networks usually don't have a DHCP server running, or if they have one running, it's only for submitting additional information. But the IP address assignment is usually done by the clients, so you don't have state in a DHCP server for this. So. IPv6 networking actually makes your life easier. That's it. Let's have a look a bit like it's easy case, the stateless NAT64 case. So again, uh, we can use this to map a single or multiple addresses. We can map a range or a network. Usually in, in NAT64 translators, you will use uh, probably a range or one address. Stateless NAT64 is very often used for giving IPv6 only host public IPv4 addresses. So you have a big, or a big, it's just a standard sized IPv6 network, which is a slash 64. You can have a lot of hosts in it. And most hosts won't have an IPv4 address. Why? They don't need it. Some of them might need a public IPv4 address. So you can, for instance, uh, access this as a web server or as a mail server from the IPv4 internet. So um, this is very easy. So you can say like, okay, this specific IPv4 address, I map to this specific IPv6 address, stateless. You don't need to change anything like uh, when a packet arrives. This is why we call it stateless. However, stateless NAT64 is never used to give an IPv4 only host an IPv6 address. And we will see in a few minutes why this is. But first of all, let's have a look how this looks in reality. So for stateless NAT64, if I, for instance, have the 2001 DB81, I can map it to 192.0.2.1. This is a one-to-one -one mapping. You can say the IPv4 internet can access this uh, IP address, IPv4 address, and my translator maps it directly to 
uh, the IPv6 address. Or what is very, very typical is uh, that you have a NAT64 translator and that actually has um, tables where you can say like, okay, I have uh, this network and this net mask. In this case, you're on the left side, we have a slash 120. Uh, slash 120 is equivalent to eight bit of hosts, which is 256 hosts minus the networking address and the IPv4 address also the broadcasting part. And in the IPv4 network here, uh, we have slash 24, which is 32 minus uh, 24 is also 8-bit. So these two networks are equivalent and we can map with a single uh, table entry a whole network. Obviously, this depends on which size of IPv4 addresses you have available. But generally speaking, it's, it's quite an easy thing so far. So let's have a look at uh, state full NAT64. NAT Again, this is very, very similar to your NAT at home, and it is used to map many IP addresses to one IP address. And then I want to show you two very typical cases or things that you can do with, with stateful NAT64. First of all, and this is probably the most typical uh, thing that is being done with stateful NAT64 is, you want to allow an IPv6 only network, which you can see here at the top, to access the IPv4 internet. Again, a typical IPv6 uh, network has 64 bit, and the IPv4 internet only has 32 bit. So we can say we cut off the subnetwork uh, 00c001 colon colon slash uh, 96, which is 32 bit, and say any packet that we address to this network, to this slash 96 subnetwork, will pass through our NAT64 translator, which will then squash any source address from the whole slash 64 to 192.0.2.1. And with this IPv4 address, I can access the IPv4 internet. Now, because I have a lot of potential IPv6 hosts there, the NAT64 translator here needs to keep state because it, it cannot map n IPv6 addresses to the same source port, for instance, in TCP. So it needs to keep a table that says this IPv6 address is right now trying to access this IPv4 address and maps the source and destination ports there. So with every new connection, the NAT64 translator adds a new state to its table. And this is the major difference here between state full and state less uh, NAT64. Because of, of this, uh, basically of the inequality of the sizes. But again, generally speaking, uh, for the IPv6 network, it will um, not really notice that it is actually the IPv4 internet, it will just access the subnetwork and can access the whole IPv4 internet. And this, this is really very typical because often when you have an IPv6 only network, you still need to download uh, things from the IPv4 internet or you want to allow uh, clients like uh, your notebook or your, uh, your company to actually access Oh, well, the IPv4 internet and websites which are still not on IPv6, which actually gets luckily less and lesser uh, every day, but there are still some like legacy websites out there. So that's the first use case for uh, stateful NAT64. Huh. But there's another very, very interesting use case. Let's see if you spot the difference right away. So when you start to run IPv6 only networks, you will notice that at some point, well, you still have maybe some devices around which don't work with uh, IPv6. So you need to keep an IPv4 only island, which you can see here at the bottom, which you can't, uh, can't uh, migrate to IPv6 because maybe the vendor doesn't give you a new firmware or uh, the device is an industry device, uh, maybe in a power plant, which you know you can't upgrade, and it will stay there with IPv4 for the next, I don't know, maybe 50 years, or until whenever the power plant is uh, done with operation. 
So, but you want to still manage, or you have to keep this IPv4 only network in your shiny, nice IPv6 only environment. Or you want to be able to access this IPv4 only network, which is usually with private IP addresses from the IPv6 internet. So let's try to rethink this again. <clears throat> you have a computer, let's say your notebook that you're just right now in front of. This notebook has an IPv6 address and you want to access an IPv4 only device in a totally different network. So what we can do is we can say, well, we have a NOT64 translator, which for instance maps uh, this IPv6 network to this IPv4 network here. So what it does for this, it will again squash the whole IPv6 internet this time to one IP address that is potentially even in the same IPv4 network. And the whole IPv6 internet can access this IPv4 only network why is this not a 6 4 translator? So this is really cool because generally speaking, you can design all your networks IPv6 only nowadays. You don't need to think about any IPv4 subnetting, about weird uh, network masks, about where do you get I public IPv4 addresses. All of this is past. You build IPv6 only networks. And if you really happen to have IPv4 only hosts, well, what you do with them is you just put them in an IPv4 only island that you map via an IPv6 uh, NAT64 translator. Isn't that nice? It's a beauty. It's a real beauty. And now I have to do a short advertisement. I know, most of you already know this, but I have to show this because this is the VWIP I was talking about last time. And you see it, I just, I mean, you don't have to use this device, but uh, my point is, you see this VBIP has two Ethernet ports. And this VBIP is, is really, really easy to uh, put a NAT64 translator based on YOL on it. And basically what you can do is, you can say, you have here a LAN port to which you put uh, the IPv4 only network. You put the WAN port to the IPv6 internet and Basically, you say this device here translates your uh, your IPv4 island, and it's you know you see it, it's tiny, and it's quite affordable. So you can like basically whenever you have an IPv4 only network, you use this device, plug in uh, IPv4 on one side, IPv6 on the other side, and you're done. So point is, you don't need this one but you can use any such nice device. This one is actually running OpenVRT and you can translate uh, and access your IPv4 only island. And the point I want to make with this is when anybody comes and says like, oh, you can't build an IPv6 only network because it's very expensive to build to maintain this IPv4 only host, that's simply not true. It's simple and it's easy and it makes your life much easier if you go IPv6 only and you only have some IPv4 islands left if you really need to. Well, small brackets open, brackets closed. You see how stay for next 64 works. So in a summary, not 64. What you need to really know is that there are stateful and stateless operations, that you have a huge asymmetry in size and that you can always map the whole IPv4 internet stateless from uh, the IPv6 world, it doesn't work the other way around. And NAT64 in general is used to build IPv6 only networks that can reach the IPv4 internet, which is very helpful. Or it allows you to build IPv4 islands, which are accessible by IPv6 networks. It also allows you to assign IPv6 addresses to IPv4 only hosts in a stateful manner and assign public or any kind of IPv4 addresses to IPv6 only hosts. I hope it was understandable and I hope uh, you enjoyed this NAT64 introduction. And uh, I wish you a lot of fun building your IPv6 networks and to use uh, NAT64 to bridge when necessary. Wish you a good evening. Thanks for listening and have a good time.